Hello, and welcome to Young at Harp. Today, we're going to talk about the vicious cycle of greater success leading to greater overwhelm. My name is Deborah Henson Conant, also known as Deborah, also known as DHC. I am a composer and a performer, and I am here with Kathleen Wiley, who is a Jungian psychoanalyst, and we both play the harp, so we call this Young at Harp. So Kathleen, this is kind of up for me right now. I'm, I have three parts to my life. I'm a composer and a performer, and I also have an online school. And during the pandemic, I've mostly been focusing on that school because it's mm -hmm. online. And now that things are starting to open up, I'm getting offers of performances and I'm also, uh, my, my works are being performed more. And it's wonderful, I love it, it's exactly what I want and it's completely overwhelming. Mm -hmm. And I don't have systems set up to get, you know, make everything and then I get frantic and then I just go into overwhelm. So I wanted to, and I think, and we talked a little about this ahead of time, that it's not just circumstance. It's not just a strategic solution here. It's not like I have to read the 12 step year or the four week hour or whatever like that. I like that four, the four week hour. Um, that this is something that I'm actually recreating possibly from stuff in my childhood, but this sense of overwhelm and we talked a little bit about why people might create or uh, why I might and others might create overwhelm in their lives. Like, what does it, what do I get from this? You know, what struck me as you were just saying that is that the overwhelm is emotional. It's it, meaning, let me say it differently, that the overwhelm is a state of body sensation that activates or comes along with a certain emotion or feeling that then gives rise to thoughts. So that for all of us, the root of the overwhelm, so like stinking thinking that the 12 step programs talk about, we can track back, or at least as a Jungian analyst, I believe we have to track back to what is that body state that gets activated? Can I just ask you to actually define stinking thinking? I've heard it a yeah. lot, but I don't know that I've ever asked, what exactly does that mean? I think it's a kind of thinking that is distorted, that is erroneous, that keeps us caught in self-sabotaging patterns. And that from my experience working with people for 30 years, is typically rooted in early, early childhood experiences where these energy centers, these body sensations and emotions that we have no idea what they are, what they're about, what generated them, still live in us and they kick in. And then when they kick in, our ego takes over and we make up all kinds of stories about them, the stinking thinking. <laughs> Okay, so all right, so we we have these emotions, and then we make these thoughts. When you were saying just before you said that, I was thinking, "Wow, it's true. Overwhelm has a feeling, and I wonder if I'm addicted, in a sense, to that feeling." You know, especially during the pandemic. Although it's, this is certainly not has come out of the pandemic, but I'm alone a lot. Mm -hmm. You know, and so there's not other people I'm engaging with and there's maybe not a lot of engagement. I'm, I'm thinking about this because a friend of mine has a cat that just died and um, he was just there was so much emotion, so much emotion for him in those days leading up to that. So much love, so much connection because he knew the cat was going to was dying. And um, and now it's been about a week and a half and he was saying, you know, I'm, I'm sad, but I also kind of miss that that even though it was painful, I missed that love that I, that I was feeling. And so I'm thinking that um, I made just, just the sense of turmoil, the sense that something's happening, that that itself may be engaging for me. But, but I'm also really curious, I'm always suspicious of myself about wanting to hide. Mm. And you talked a little bit about that when we were speaking before that the overwhelm, all these things that kind of, what are the things in our childhood that might lead us to want to hide as adults and then to create situations in which we, uh, in, in which we eventually hide, although we may not 
think we're hiding. Yeah. Um, yeah, I feel for your friend with their cat. <laughs> I just, um, those connections that we have are so important. And that sense of presence of another yes. warm body being. Right. And perhaps that is the reason sometimes that we hide is that we've had experiences of when we came out, we shared whatever we were feeling we acted on whatever impulses we had. Some warm human connection that we had got withdrawn and we got criticized or we got judged or we got slapped or we got scolded or we got put in time out. And that- Or, or it, I'm just thinking as you're saying this because I have this experience every time I get off of a Zoom call that I'm enjoying. Or, or I do harp time live once a week where I'm meeting with people and I'm teaching them something that's really, I, that I really love. And every time I get off, I have this kind of sinking feeling. And recently I thought, I, it almost feels like shame. Mm -hmm. and, um, and, and, and I've often felt this complete disconnect as if, if I was playing music for somebody and in that space when I stop playing and we go back to real life, it's very difficult. And as you just, you just said a word, which was withdrawn, it's like human connection is withdrawn. Mm -hmm. And in that moment that that connection is withdrawn, whether I'm turning off the Zoom or I've just had this connection with people and now it's over, that's very, um, I think we're on another subject here, but um, it, and lately I've just had to say, stop for a second and just let all of that drain out of me. Instead of going onto something or trying to turn the radio on or something, stand there for a minute, let it, let it wash through. And now that you're just saying this, I'm, I'm getting more awareness that what I want to do is also celebrate the connection that I had that was just withdrawn so that I understand that I'm standing in that, in that moment of emptiness after that beautiful thing. That is so important. And you just articulated a basic principle of how, how we can short circuit overwhelm, which is slow down enough to consciously register, acknowledge, be present with whatever, <laughs> whatever we're feeling in the moment. <laughs> But, because, but, but then we have to slow down. <laughs> How can anything? Okay, I hear you. I hear you. Ah, ah that means discipline. <laughs> well, it means discipline in the sense of being a disciple unto oneself. It means discipline in the sense that we are going to follow the lead of our own larger soul, that we're not going to forge ahead, leaving parts of ourselves behind. <laughs> because those parts of us we leave behind become like the albatross. And man, when they get a little wind, we are overwhelmed. You know? It's like they take us over. And, and by that point, if there are, you know, 15, 15 things I haven't registered in the last two hours, then I'm going to feel overwhelmed. Well, you're also, when you said no, no, not leaving behind, it reminds me of, you know, um, in, I, not that I'm a, 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 I don't understand war and, and, and soldiers, but I do know the, the passion and, and commitment to not leaving w one person behind. And, you know, regardless, you're not, you're not sitting there calculating when it comes to a human life. It is in no person left behind. And, and that, I mean, this, that feels really emotional, and and I think that in fact you're absolutely right that I that I am rushing off and probably leaving all. Not I'm saying probably, but I'm sure it's true. All these parts of me behind. So so we started this in in the conversation about overwhelm, mm -hmm. and um, one of the things that was really interesting to me that we said in the in the in the pre-talk um, was uh, you said something about. Uh, people, you know, when they had neglect or abuse or something in their childhood, then they start creating these situations as adults that then allow them to hide. I'm curious about that. 
Yeah, what I want to say is whatever we've experienced in the past that we've left behind, we'll look for a way to manifest and show up in the present. So sometimes what happens, and let's just go to success for a minute. Mm -hmm. If let's just say you um, you had a had a wonderful a wonderful ex spontaneous expression. I'm thinking about you're talking about when you were a little girl, you'd sit at the piano and you'd make up your stories, and you know this would be the part of going up the steps, and then you go back down the steps, and the monster would come. If oh, you just, know my story. <laughs> if let's just say in that spontaneous expression of something that you were experiencing internally, you were putting out there in the world vis-a-vis -vis the music. If someone came along and said, what are you doing? That sounds ridiculous. Then all of a sudden there is going to be shame because here you were out there in the world, just in your glory at three, four, five, six, however old, and someone came along and saw you and they didn't celebrate that with you. Their response shamed you. And maybe they didn't say anything and maybe they, neither of these situations, maybe neither one of them intended to shame you, but you felt that. And, you know, at three, four, and five, we don't have enough self to be able to make sense of that or to be able to say, well, that's what they think or feel. That's not what I think or feel. Um, we don't have the language to do that. We don't have the cognitive processes. So that body sensation of whatever you felt at that moment of that reaction just becomes like this little sore that festers. And so then here you are in the present and you do something creative. Like last week we talked about you're sending the proposal for your legacy project. Then you get back a response that isn't the one you want. And without even realizing what's happening, this feeling place back here gets triggered. And so then all kinds of defenses can come up around that. Defenses like you said, well, I'm not understood. No one will ever get me or I'm just a victim. I never get what I want or that wasn't what you said, but um, you know, or my work's no good anyway, whatever it is. All the, all, the, all the drama. All the drama. The drama of it. And it's fueled by this wound back here, by this breach of warm human connection. You know, as you were saying that, I was thinking two things. I was, or well, three things. I was thinking how, because of that, part of the overwhelm may be that I'm forging ahead, or those of us who experience this, forging ahead and holding, like, we're, like, as we go, we're, mm, wait a second, don't do that, ah! That that's happening. I thought about that, and I also thought about, you know, I was always watching as a kid, and, um, and even now, you know, I'm, I'm watching, my eyes are watching people, and I think that even if somebody hadn't said that to me, I may have seen them e suppressing themselves. Yes. Or someone say it to them. And right. If you were right. Uh, them. Yes. And and then it even and actually, thank you because I think that you know my mother was a performer, and I know that she had stage fright, and I know that she auditioned for things and she didn't get them, mm -hmm. and I know there were all these things happening that I was barely aware of, and I think that probably all children or all people, well, you know this that if there's abuse happening in a home to someone else, it's it's just as terrifying as if it's happening to you. And maybe even more so in the sense that I can dissociate when it's happening to me, but I can't so much dissociate when I see it happening to somebody else. And so um, even if somebody's self-abusing -abu themselves, uh, or, or, or just, you know, how she, her, her anxiety about, about being a performer, just seeing that can get perpetuating. And, you know, it's funny because I always used to see my little brother um, who's this just amazing person and incredibly expressive and 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 I, there was something where he would like do something and then and then he get there was he would just like pull back just this little bit and I just kept watching this thing of this and I I, I wouldn't even know how to describe it mm -hmm. 
Um, but there was this like, I want to go, but I want to go, but. Yeah. And that seems like that would create so much overwhelm. Yeah, because you're left with all this central nervous system activation that never gets a discharge that's satisfying. You know, this is so much the rise of addiction. You know, you can never get enough of what you really don't need. So the addict thinks the next drink will do it or one more piece of chocolate or, you know, one more bowl of ice cream or, you know, one more shopping spree. But you can never get enough of what you really don't need because those are all attempts to discharge that impulse where the natural movement has been thwarted. So maybe, you know, your brother, for, well, I'm thinking about, I learned to swim as an adult. So I took swimming lessons, um, you know, gosh, 12, 14 years ago when I bought my house here on the lake. And I really had to work with that part of me that every time I was going to go to the pool for a lesson or to practice, and I was thinking, okay, I'm supposed to put my head in the water, keep my body afloat turn my head to the side and breathe and move my arms and kick my legs all at the same time, coordinate. I mean, how am I going to do this? You know? A little bit like playing the harp sometimes, like I'm supposed to do all these things simultaneously. But I had to really work every time I was going to go with that part of me that as a little girl did feel shame because I wasn't athletic. You know, I was the last one picked for the teens. You know, I didn't have a good body image. And so every time I was going to go to the pool, I had to take myself lovingly in hand and say, come on, it's okay. You can do this. This is normal. Every time you go to the pool, the people who are going back and forth multiple times in their lanes speak to you and encourage you. And I would take my hand, myself in hand lovingly with that part of me that didn't want to go, with that part of me that was felt shame, and we'd go. And eventually, and I can still remember the day I managed to swim the entire length of the pool. <laughs> it was like, oh my God, I got it. I finally, I, I mean, I remember that day. And so- And how, and how old were you? I mean, are you don't- uh... <laughs> Well, it, I, I was in my, um, I, I was, I was an adult. I was a mature adult. <laughs> okay. So you were over 35. <laughs> All right. It you were kind of of, it, yeah. It depends on if we're counting chronological years or we're counting spirit right. years. I mean, I'm, as, I'm asking that. Sorry. Sorry to ask that. I'm asking that because I think that, um, well, first of all, I love that image, and I'm 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 looking at overwhelm as we talk, and I'm thinking about this image of you know when when there's all these parts of us that are scared. So you you mentioned there's one that um, th there was one part of you that always got picked last, and there was one part of you that wasn't athletic, and there were probably others. So already I saw three of you, yeah. and three of you with different you know at least two with different fears going towards this and and probably you weren't even aware of those things and maybe even at the time maybe until you started talking about it and i'm thinking of all the parts of me that are coming to oh, how to deal with my emails like you know like an like um you know everything that's in my head about that um and 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 it, and it sounds like a, a great exercise to actually break that down into different personas you know like never you know like there's the one who always you know, had to write the thank you letter and did it badly you know the person who is gonna is gonna spell the person's name wrong or get their name wrong you know all these little things that you know that that i'm afraid of or that i or that i've made fun of in other people yes yes because those are all in us right. and often the overwhelm that we're experiencing is really an anxiety generated by these various parts of ourself by these various bits of ourself again where there's still some energy that's alive that's mm. from a past experience and it's a paradox as I could gather those parts of me and get myself to the gym to practice, to the pool to practice. 
they began to lose their sting. They began to have less power. Doesn't mean they went away, but they lost their power. It's like that helium balloon got deflated. And well, you were talking before about, and you said something about Jung talking about thoughts. And it sounds like, uh, cause I was just about to say, okay, what led up to this, you know, what, before, you know, what led up to the, okay, yes, moving to your home and you had a lake and you better learn how to swim lest you fall in. Right. But, but what's all the other stuff that, and maybe that's all that led up to this decision, but you were also saying before something about thoughts being like dreams. And I don't know why it made me think of this right here. Sure. Yeah. Jung says that thoughts are as much an objective reality as dreams. And what he means by that is that our thoughts are generated by our larger unconscious self. Our ego conscious self does not create our thoughts. As Now, I can sit down and I can say, what are the thoughts, the affirmations I want to tell myself? But you and I both know, and I'm sure all our listeners do, that affirmations are not effective unless they're connected to a passion that you can feel in your body. So that passion is, is not something that the ego creates. It's not something subjective that the I pulls up, but it's something that's generated by the larger objective self we have no control over. So that's our, so our passion is connected to whatever has touched us. I mean, to, to the spark of life. Yes. You're making, as you're, as you're talking about these thoughts, um, I'm, I, I'm thinking about sleeping beauty because I'm thinking about, um, I'm thinking about the, what happens in that, in the beginning to create mm. that curse. So what happens is this child is getting all these gifts and one person is jealous from being left out. You know, one of the one of the fairies has been left out because there's only twelve plates. Whatever, it doesn't matter. Um, the the so the fairy, the bad fairy, bad her in, in pain fairy, says you will die. You know, you will prick your finger and you will die. On mm -hmm. um, anyway, so the next fairy that comes, this is the thing that I think is really fascinating. Says, I can't take that curse away, mm -hmm. but. I can mitigate it. And that's probably not exactly the word she uses, mm -hmm. but I can mitigate it. I can say that that will happen, mm -hmm. but it won't be final. Mm -hmm. And, and the touch of, or the kiss of love will break that spell. Mm -hmm. I don't know why this is coming up for me now. Well, no, I know why, because you're saying our thoughts are objective. We they're, they're going to come up. We can't right. control that first thing that happens, but, yes. but we can do the next thing. Yes. Yeah, that is beautiful. And you know, in Sleeping Beauty, it is so important to remember the curse was put because the fairy was left out. Exactly. And so I would have done the same thing. <laughs> yeah. So whatever we leave out of our own experience, has the potential to become like the fairy who curses us. And so it is so important, and we're back to overwhelm now, that if we feel overwhelmed, to stop, take three deep breaths and say, okay, what's going on? And if we have to, if it's, if it's, we're too agitated to actually sit still and do that or to draw a mandala, then get some objects in your house and start enlisting objects as parts of yourself that you're feeling. So, you know, <laughs> well, I'm thinking, as you just said this, I thought, you know, I've always been over overwhelmed. There's too much, there's too much, there's too much. But suddenly I just thought, what if I stopped and I breathed and I said, something is being left out. Something is missing. Something is not being heard. Something is not being acknowledged. Mm -hmm. Yes, that's beautiful. Because if we stopped when we felt overwhelmed and took those three deep breaths and said, what's being left out? 
I'm not a betting woman, but I'd wager more often than not, something will pop up, an image, a thought, a feeling. And then you can breathe deep and say, okay, what do you need me to know? What do you need from me? And there's parts of me that didn't want to go get in the pool because I was embarrassed and Mm -hmm. this or that and judgmental and this or that. Um, I just had to see them. And when I could see them and say, okay, yeah, that didn't feel good when you were, you never got picked for the team in grade school. It didn't feel good. And now it didn't feel good that you felt awkward in your body. And you know what? That's okay because we're doing something different now. And, and being loving, that kiss of love, that self-compassion to just be able to make space for that part of us. And, and so the fairy that followed the 13th fairy knew that, you know? And you know, it's, it's really interesting because in the story, the kiss of love come just uh, is coming through thorns. Thorns yes. have grown up around and yet the kiss of love is like I'm getting in there somehow. And and uh and 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 so a certain trust of that. Um ugh, I could just go I'm I'm gonna I'm 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 just going off on different tangents here. But I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna look at that story not as though I mean, we, it's easy to look at that story as men and women, blah, 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 blah. I'm just going to look at it as the parts of myself and, and, the, and you know, all of that. Oh, God, oh, I can't remember if it was before at the pre-talk or during this that I was talking about how, um, and maybe you'll remember, one of the things I've experienced lately, and it is not overwhelmed, but it is kind of along these lines, is um, whenever I'm engaged, like the minute we're, we're off this mm-hmm. uh, and I hit the end, I will probably have this feeling of like emptiness. Mm-hmm. And um, certainly it, once once a week when I do Hard Time Live, and if I already said this, I apologize. Um, you know, and I'm talking to 40, 50 people and teaching them something I really want to teach them. And, you know, I, we, I, 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 I like, bye everyone. And I hit the button and they're gone. This withdrawal mm-hmm. of connection mm-hmm. is a very, um, is very uh, visceral. And again, I've just lately, and sorry if I just did just say this, stood there and just let it wash through me. Mm-hmm. And, and I, I thought it was a feeling of shame. So I was just like, let the shame just wash through me. The shame, maybe because I, you know, I've been visible. I don't know why, but it, it hadn't occurred to me till we talk that it may, may or may not be shame. It may just be that with that sh- change of state from connection to being alone and letting that wash through. And then asking my question, and because I would ask, what is missing? And I would, and I might add to myself, gratitude for what I just experienced. Yeah, you know, you did share that. And I'm so glad you brought us back to it because I think there's several, um, there's several things that come to my mind about it. Um, and I'm going to hopefully not forget them. But, but the first one is that we are often shamed inadvertently, I don't think it's intentional, although it can sometimes be, but as little kids, I think we can be very, we can be shamed for our desire for human connection. Mm. So the two-year-old who wants mommy to pick her, pick her up when mommy's trying to get dinner ready, you know, may not always get picked up and may sometimes get responded to in a leave me alone, you're bothering me, which can feel like oh, I've done something wrong or bad, which is the core of shame. So I do think sometimes after we have felt a warm human connection and then we're back alone, that, oh, (gasps) I've done something wrong by enjoying the connection so much, you know, by wanting that so much. So that's one thought that came to my mind. The second thought that came to my mind is we do encounter ourselves via our interaction with other people. So sometimes I suggest to people that if we think about when we're together, There are little golden threads that go from my solar plexus to you and golden threads from your solar plexus to me. And that when we leave, the interaction ends. If those golden threads, those bits of our own self and energy stay out there, then it can sometimes feel as if we're losing parts of ourself. 
So sometimes it's helpful to just imagine pulling those golden threads back in, knowing that whatever bits of ourself we've sent out are coming back and that they're coming back with a bit of the other person that's enriched them. So we're not losing connection to the other, but we are experiencing it within ourselves now. So that was the second thing that came to my mind. Um, and then the third thing is transitions can be hard, period. You know, the transition, like I have to watch when I want to eat mindlessly is from the end of the workday into the start of the evening because it's transition. Mm -hmm. I've gone from focus, 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 and now there's going to be more relaxed space. Even though I almost always have a to-do list, there's going to be more. So transitions I think for all of us can be um, anxiety provoking and overwhelming because of the variety of choices. And it can also, again, activate any previous transitions we went through, which don't always go well, you know? I mean, think about some tumultuous transitions like breakup of relationships or, you know, there, there are lots of transitions that don't go smoothly. So. I think, again, do, doing what you're doing by stopping and breathing, giving gratitude for what you've experienced and just acknowledging, yeah, OK, it's different now. Now I'm going back to just being with me. Well, I, I really love that image. And at, in the middle of it, I was like, oh, it's like fishing. It's like we put, you know, and now we're, we're bringing bringing all that back. Um, and so I'm thinking that after that, there are all these transitions in the day. And, and it's funny because we started off talking about overwhelm mm -hmm. and um, and now we're talking about transition. And I'm thinking that in, in between each thing um, to, to take that moment and it may take me a long time at first, like it took you a long time to swim across the, uh, the pool at first to coordinate this. It may take me 10 minutes to um, bring back what I've gotten and let it be. And then I also thought about everything when transitions in my life, I've made a mess. I've usually made some kind of a mess with everything I do, you know, whatever, pa there's a paper out, or, you know, I've written something, taking just a little bit of a moment to put at least 1% of it where it goes. It would be great if I put 100% of it, but um, that will, it, it seems like, it seems like the overwhelm isn't so much that I've got too much to do, but that everything's, you know, it's, it's, it's a big mess and I'm not really um, doing one thing at a time. And we were talking about tracking, mm -hmm. tracking things. And I was thinking about when I was a musician um, and when I was a musician, when I was learning how to play the harp. <laughs> Back in the old days when I used to be a musician, <laughs> as I was learning to be a musician. I realized, and with all my friends, that there was a 20 minute limit to our to our focus. Mm -hmm. And so I always practiced in 20 minute increments. Now, maybe I could focus for 20 minutes. And at the end of that 20 minutes, if I was still focused, I'd take another 20 minutes. But it was always in 20 minute increments. And I was always focused on what I was doing. Mm -hmm. And I realized that I don't do that. I'm multitasking a lot. And that there's I like it. I think it's fun. And so I want to think about that. But but I um, I want to think about really putting 20 minute increments as well. And I know there's something called Pomodoro, which I often I often have a co-working room. Pomodoro is where you work for 25 minutes and then you take a five minute break and work for 25 minutes in focused um, and often focused um, co-working with other people. And okay. I do that with people. But um, but I'm thinking that this tracking of what I am doing. So whatever I can do to um, not only say, what am I doing now? You know, keeping my time, using a timer to help me, and then also actually integrating these things. Yes. Integrating what I just got, whatever it was, the connection I got, and then just a little bit of cleanup, the tiniest bit to keep things uh, at first, to keep things organized might help me. But, you know, I also want to be very aware that this is not a strategic problem. This is I'm I'm getting overwhelmed because I'm think I'm scared or I want to hide or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm thinking about putting the sheet of paper back and if for me, when I think of my environment as an extension of myself, 
then if my environment is an extension of myself, then going ahead and filing the note I just made in the right folder is kind of like akin to pulling that thread back into me. It's in its place. And now I don't have to think about it. It, it isn't, it isn't distracting me every time I look over on my I phone. totally hear you. I totally love it. It makes total sense until it doesn't work. Yeah. And, 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 and so I want to be aware that there's something else there. There's, yes. there's, um, and I want to go back to the very first thing, greater success leading to greater overwhelm. Mm -hmm. So as things start happening that we want, it seems like that often, for me at least, that often is what leads to the overwhelm. And I love all the strategic stuff, put the thing back, but I want to go to the heart of this. And I know we only have three minutes, but I want to go to the heart of if, if I were to think that overwhelm is not my natural state mm -hmm. of being, and if I wish to recover to my natural state of being, bleh, how do I do that? <laughs> and how do I do that? In two and a half minutes, Kathleen, take it away. You stop and you breathe and you give gratitude for what you just experienced you scan your body and acknowledge whatever's coming up on a feeling level and whatever memories that taps back to. You engage with those by dialoguing with any that needs your attention. And then you give it a kiss of love. That act of being present. You know, the prince cuts through the thorns. Right. You know, Briar Rose is the old name of Sleeping Beauty because the roses with their briars grew up around the castle in which she was sleeping. And he had to cut through that. And for any of you who are rose tenders, you know, you get pricked sooner or later with those thorns and you have to have the right gloves. So we have to be willing to move from greater success and not get caught in the overwhelm to, to stay with the greater success to be willing to cut through the, the briars, to be willing to say, yeah, there's the rose and here's the thorn. And how am I gonna move it out of the way and not get pricked? And it's not about strategy. The moving out of the way isn't about strategy, but it is about that passion of desire to move forward. The prince knew this beauty was in there. And the prince was determined. Oh, oh, right. He heard that. Okay. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So, and many princes before had tried only to get lost in the briars. It was his passion, his love, his energy from within his own nature. We might say his larger self. So for you, for me, for all of us, and we talked about the vision of the heart a few weeks ago, that vision of the heart really becomes the passion that allows us to cut through the, the briar roses of overwhelm. <laughs> okay, so what I'm hearing is the vision, the vision of love is it sees beyond, beyond the briars. It sees yeah. into ourselves. And, le and let's say we're the prince and we're the sleeping mm -hmm. self and, and we've created the briars. Right. And, um, and so to be able to see in, and I'm just imagining, you know, we always have hands, but he's got to take a break and he's got to, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking about, you know, what, I'm not going to go into the whole thing. I mean, I would like to have analyzed the fairy tale characters. You know, I'd love to do a series on that, but um, I'm just thinking for myself, knowing that it is now time to stop, um, mm -hmm. that if I come away from this, I need he he would have had to keep connecting to that vision yes. and and if we are that prince and we are keep connecting to that vision of us that is asleep mm -hmm. in that castle with the briars that we've created around them to to really take that break and and breathe i mean and i may not be able to do all the things the body scan and everything like that but i do think that i can stop for a second and breathe and be grateful for something. And in particular, 
for a connection that I've just had. And I do think that anytime I feel that sinking feeling, I can stop for a second and let it con and, and realize that what is the gold thread that I, what are the gold threads that because I see them as filigrees. Yes. What are the gold threads that just got broken away and how can I bring them in and and have joy for that and then put away one piece of paper or yeah. look at it at least. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I mean, you're so right. The most important thing is that stopping to be with oneself and and pull those threads back in and reconnecting to the passion, the heart's desire, the larger self. Yeah, because yeah. otherwise I'm thinking he's like, ah, oh, there's just too many briars here and blah, blah, mm -hmm. blah, blah. But every time he stops, takes a drink of water is like, I know that's in there. Yeah. Yeah, he's got to reconnect. There's that's you, we've got to stay connected to source, and source is the larger self that comes up through our body mind. It's the from the unconscious. I mean, we have to stop, but this could lead us into talking about the muse as the bridge to that for the musician artist um, or in any creative project. So, in a way, the taking of the break, we can imagine if it's on a on a project that's creative, that you're reconnecting with, with the muse is bridging you back to that source of energy in you. Cool, very cool. So I, I feel like we went f quite far afield, started talking about success leading to overwhelm, but really we're talking about our connection to ourselves as always and how we make that connection. But that makes a lot of sense that the overwhelm, that the, you know, get the overwhelm is the briars and we can re keep reconnecting um so i really i can't wait to try this <laughs> i'm going to try it as soon as we get off and um and kathleen thank you as always for being willing to go on this journey with me i love it and i'm so glad we can share <laughs> yeah me too i'll see you next week okay bye-bye bye-bye